I recently got to sit down with Willie Rodriguez. Willie is the drummer on the new Mars Volta record, which just came out. I talked about a few weeks ago, I believe. Um, just came out. Really, really fantastic record. Like they're calling it their quote unquote pop record. Uh, just really, really interesting choices. Great drumming, great pattern, great songs. Um, so my first question was how did he end up working with the Mars Volta? Because Willie is a New York City based jazz, Latin jazz drummer percussionist. Um, he won a Latin Grammy for his work with Mon Laferte on the album Norma. Uh, he does some gigging with Dave Lehman and just a lot of great artists around New York City. So obviously the conversation started with, well, how did you end up with the Mars Volta? And then we go into, you know, how that record was made, how he recorded all of his parts, you know, the gear he used, a really, really fun hang. So let's get to it with Willie Rodriguez. Sweet. Well, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for coming on. Um, <laughs> Quite a surprise when I saw those. First of all, there's a new Mars Volta record, and then it was like, who the heck's playing drums on it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the obvious first question is how does a Latin Grammy winning, award winning jazz drummer end up on a Mars Volta record? Oh, first, thank you so much for having me, Mike. Um, well, first, I got the Latin Grammy with him, with Omar. Okay. That's the, the first thing. But um, yeah, um, everything started with me and Omar working with Mon Laferte. Uh, we did this beautiful album in 2018. But um, just going back to that, I, I met Omar through Leo Genovese, who's a wonderful piano player, one of the, one of the leading voices in jazz, especially today. Really, not, really, he worked with Esperanza Spalding, with a lot of people, and just the sweetest guy in the world. And he called me for this session for the singer, from Mexico and long story short, it was Omar's work. And we met the first day in that session and totally we clicked right away. He's, he's, he's from Puerto Rico, you know, and of course the Island love came up right away. And it was, it was love at first sight, super nice guy and sweetest person. Yeah. And I'm so glad he would be working since, since then actually. So it was, it's been a blessing for sure. Okay, so what other projects did you do before this? Oh, before this, I used to. Well, I'm, I live in New York, so I've, I've been doing a lot of jazz here, and um, mostly, um, you know, the New York life, surviving mm -hmm. the city, you know, and then playing a lot of styles from salsa to jazz to wedding gigs. You know, you know how we do here, uh, yeah. but. Um, Mostly working a lot of, of jazz and contemporary improvisation stuff and, and you know, doing my own stuff. And then I, I moved here from Boston in 2014. So the, 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 those four years was like that, that the pandemic hit. And so, you know, then all this remote situation and, you know, that we all went through. And yeah, but now being here since 2014, so it's been almost seven to eight years and and, you know, doing my own stuff with my group and doing my album this year, thank God, too. And, and yeah, you know, doing that New York musician life <laughs> that we all Is do. Is it coming back? I, I lived up there for like 17 years. We left in the middle of the pandemic. Oh, my God. It felt, it felt pretty dire because I was doing a lot of subbing on Broadway. Oh, wow. And when that yeah. shut down, it was like, okay, I think it's time to leave. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how is it recovering? It is, man, it in a way have not been the same anymore, especially for jazz. For jazz, it's been a little, not different, but, but more, I don't know, it's weird. It started now it's like restaurant gigs, a lot of restaurant gigs doing jazz, of course, smalls open again. And, 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 and now fat cat is not fat cat is cellar dog. So everything is opening again, but it's pretty, pretty much back to normal, but a lot of people left too. And, it's kind of like school is now school is coming back now officially like this semester i think it's like the first time that kids are gonna come back you know and and the vibe is gonna hopefully come back at the same time you know as, as me and you we're older people so it, it seems like now i go like to smalls i don't know anyone you know it's like wow mm. so many new people and all this stuff but i think it's it's it's, it's back to normal and probably not back to new york that me and you used to know but uh but definitely yeah definitely a lot of hope a lot of young faces and definitely the music is still alive and you know i don't know how affordable it is for musicians to stay so let's see how that goes but um 
but so far, yeah, the, 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 the city is alive, a lot of creativity, like always, and you know, a lot of New York nest, you know, once, once a lot of yeah, place yeah. in your experience. Yeah. <laughs> so you moved there from Boston. Why were you in Boston? No, I went to school over there. Yeah. I did the whole okay. Berkeley NEC stuff and, you know, and, and, I lived there for 12 years, actually. That's how I met Leo and all those guys there. And I worked there a lot and, you know, and moved here with my wife in 2014. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about, well, how did, how did you get asked to do the Mars Volta record? Was it just because you were working with Omar and it was the obvious choice? I mean, how did that come about? Well, um, yeah, basically, yes. I bet me and Omar, we've been working for, we did the Mon Laferte album and that went great. We won the Grammy everyone was super happy it was a beautiful experience we went to capitol records and it was five days over there and then omar was producing the album and he he like hired bruce bucknick who's like a legendary engineer he he did like the doors tony william lifetime this guy is a legend and then of course he's there and then he invited his friends but suddenly all smith was there who just passed away so sad nicest guy in the world and then uh, we were there just surrounded by amazing people and, and creating this beautiful album with him. And it was, it was such a great experience. And then we did that. And then, you know, he's, he's, he's a, he's a kind of off the grid type of guy, you know, he lived in El Paso by that time. And he, um, you know, I had with him for, for a few weeks and he never carried his phone. His phone is always in the, you know, in the floor or someplace or in, a, or, or in a drawer, you know, he's not like a phone guy. He's a little, you know, little off the grid, like, like people say now. And so um, he just like called me a week before anything, just like, hey, man, I'm here. What are you doing? So let's do it. So we've been doing that back and forward for since 2018. And then after five or four sessions, he just called me one day and said, hey, man, I want you to do the March Volta album. I'm like, what? I almost cry. Then he, yeah. And then we went for it. I got COVID at the same time, the same week. It was, yeah, I'm grateful because he actually waited for me. He like canceled everything and they came back and really, really nice, man. And um, we worked on all this music and he just gave me this little clips, like a minute, minute and 10. And he told me what he wanted. And, and, and he basically said, yeah, we're doing a pop album. And I'm like, this is confusing. <laughs> Imagine. I'm like practicing all this crazy pattern because my man's calling me for gigs and then he told me, yep. Yeah. yeah. So don't bring your trash stack at all. Um, so, um, so then of course uh, we did it and he's just a musical genius, man. This type of people who are just super talented, super intellectual, so hip people, you know, and I'm just glad to be, able to surround myself with that type of creative personalities and how they I feel blessed to be working with them you know it is it was a beautiful experience it was not nothing you know people say you know people talk a lot on, on social media all the stuff and I know now because you know people are hitting me off with the craziest questions but um but yeah it is it is it is it is a different world from from what I not expected from what I heard from people saying, you know, and really nice people to tell you they're a beautiful family. Did you, was it recorded in New York or did you go out to LA? No, we did. Um, tomorrow just, I recorded like 40 tracks for this album to tell you the truth. Mm. So we did some an electric lady to my understanding. We did some at back air recording in New Jersey, New York area. Um, I will say 80% of the album, probably 90, what happens in Jersey. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it was, it was during the pandemic day. So of course I, I, it, I don't keep the tracks that he sent me. So I, I'm kind of like familiar with the sound. So of course he, he gave me something really simple, like a beat with a little path and little keyboard on it or something. And, and from that we develop, but basically, yeah, man, my man is, such a boss because with Mon Laferte, he with it, it, it was a challenge too because it was just a, a acoustic guitar and a singer, and me and him we, you know, we basically he he, he basically 
I created the beat, but he created the structure, you know what I'm saying? So with my support, that was a little different. He got most of the stuff created. I was just putting ghost notes, accents, hip drum stuff, you know, stuff like that, fills. And yeah, basically that's most of it. But my man, of course, he have his magic and he have a really, really interesting He's a drummer himself too, and in his mind, and I bet he can play drums too. And he always sing this killing stuff with his mouth. I was like, man, that's so hip. What are you doing there? <laughs> and he just he's just so creative. It's just people like that that just like, you know, I want this group, but it's they just sing the craziest hip group in the world. It's like what, you know? And they just like, you know, it's just it's that it happens to to drummers today too. I think where you play other instruments especially guitar or, or, or piano, your, your creativity span in a way that you are able to see music in a different angle. Mm-hmm. And I think he comes from that, that he played bass, guitar, drums. He's a filmmaker. He's a, you know, he has so many, so many worlds that he can navigate. So that of course create refreshing ideas, I think, in, to, to, to the, to the music creativity process. And definitely I felt that from him. Yeah. So was it just you and him and an engineer in the studio, or is there other musicians? Well, some sessions, yeah. Some sessions, it was me and uh, Electric Lady. It was me, him, and his and, and an engineer that he usually work a lot with. Um, sweetest guy. His name is Jonathan. I think Devon or or yeah, Jonathan Devon. I think his name last name. Really sweet guy. He's been working with them since this is first album, I think. And um and that was Electric Lady that we did those sessions, and then for. For the rest, I will say probably the real session for the album, it was Luis Baque, the engineer. Nice guy here in New York that he had a studio, home studio in Jersey, and he he worked with a lot of jazz artists here, and he have a really nice sound, surrounded sound, drum stuff. And and he, him, it was me, Omar, Leo, and his siblings. So Marcel and Rico were there too, and Marcel is a bad dude on, on everything. To Enrico, to I mean, these guys they they constantly creating music, man. This it, it, it was wild. Me hanging with them, I was like, when I'm on Facebook, they were like dealing with something on Pro Tools in the iPhones. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, it's just like they just like extremely working on it the whole time. I never and Omar too, man. I'm, I'm I mean, these people put me to sleep, man. It, it was like they they don't eat man they just like go in the studio working working constantly constantly don't stop it's just like and and and, and charismatic the whole time all right let's do this now i'm like dude it's, it's five in the morning and, and and they just like super into it super creative super driven and yeah really humbling experience to tell you true yeah so when you said you were given little 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 things to check out what was on most of the demos or how much most of the, of the demos song? it is so if you hear the album <clears throat> imagine they give you like a you know a you know, 808 type of groove and then i had to like bring the real drum set on it so <clears throat> nothing with ghost notes nothing with symbols nothing with um just clap something simple so you know what what's the feel what's the tempo some tunes like the most electronic tunes that you hear there, most of the drums they stay, I would say. But uh, but uh, but but most of it was most of the things were it was weird too because the first time when he gave me the the music it was like two days before and he gave me just the tracks it was a minute long, minute minute ten seconds long with just like a demo of what he wants. But then in the studio, Cedric Boyd was on it already, mm. and that was different because like oh my god the whole world changed again. So imagine you're, you're just doing this groove and then you have a, bo- a vocalist. So of course you cannot do that anymore. You have to like mm-hmm. compliment the voice. And so it, that, that was the challenge at the moment. And, 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 and Omar, we, we, Omar was like, yeah, man, this is the first time I do this too. This is like who, who record vocals before anything, you know, it was, it was like, it was like a crazy humbling experience, but man, but, but it worked out really fast. We did it super smoothly. Everything went nice, fast. We did it like in, one session was like seven hours. The other one was like eight. And, and, and it's, it was supposed to be three days, but the first day I missed it because it was my last day of quarantine from COVID. 
And then the first day, it was so weird because we all, everyone's avoiding me. Everyone's like in the corner. <laughs> and then I tested and everyone's like hugging me. Oh, my bad. I was horrible to you yesterday. Oh, my God. And then we were like bonding and kissing and smoking together again. It's like, dude, dude I can like, and, and, and it was the time that, you know, that it was, it was, it was 2021, you know, it was the real deal right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, but when they, they treated me so well, they gave me a ride home too. That was so sweet. And, you know, and nicest people, man. really nice people. So how much of your parts were kind of developed in the studio versus practiced ahead of time? So, sorry, the question again. So what was the usable? Part, mm -hmm. Yeah, the parts that you ended up playing on the tracks that we hear, was that written before you started recording or was you, were you exploring ideas in the studio? Exploring ideas and bolts. So basically, you know, like, like Black Light Shine, it was like a electronic conga and then it claps. And then I brought that for my, my concert that I brought there. So I was outside. So I had to do like a type of like a shuffle vibe. So I told him, let me try this. And you know, the ghost note. So mostly that type of thing. And some of the groups, Omar straight up come to, to me in the drum room. He was like, all right, I want this. Boom. Boom. And he sang it for me, you know? So it was, mm -hmm. it, it was, I would say some tunes have 80% my stuff. Some tunes have 20% because Omar give me everything. So it, it, it really depends on the tune to tell you the truth. But, um, but mostly, you know, the cake was done. I just brought the frosting and the colors, you know, my drums, you know, the, 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 the human part of it, mm -hmm. of, of creating feels. I, I, I hope I'm, I'm helping you know, like influencing hits and, you know, stuff like that, because some, some, uh, Omar likes stuff like that. Sometimes he, in, in mistakes, I noticed with him, he finds stuff that he like, you know, that I hit like a symbol wrong. Oh man, that's great. And then you hear the song that's a hit now. It's like, Oh man, that's amazing. You know? So see, he, he's like really that really open type of guy. And, and you know, he, he liked to see, he, he, I went there with a mind of, let me try to be as, as, you know, as, as the stuff that he do before, but he actually wanted the opposite. He wants something that he had not done before. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why I think that, that that was the most shocking thing for me in the session. But at the same time, it, it was just amazing how he worked and, you know, and, and the music, how it developed and, and the result at the end, it was like, wow, man, and the sound great, really good job, man. Really, really amazing decisions. It sounds like you're not hitting very hard, which is opposite from what, the previous records are in order for it to get the drum machines and the acoustic drums to blend it feels like your mm. dynamics are pretty low is that is that true um i was depends what you hear what it was special about omar i recorded the mon laferte album the demos with an 18 inch bass drum mm. and this album was recorded with an 18 inch bass drum too no kidding so what you hear that probably is just the kit the small and I get it. Why he like that really condensed? He like an eighteen inch tune low, so it sounds like, you know, like kind of like mm -hmm. almost like a dry eight oh eight. So he like that, I think that's what he was looking for, and um, so that's probably what you think. No, I, I was. I mean, I to create that dense groove, you have to play hard, in my opinion. You cannot. Uh, mm. I mean, if you're gonna play something kind of Radiohead vibes, you know, like a little ghost note type of thing, we did it a little bit, but for this, I was I was smacking. Yeah, I was. I okay. was playing loud for sure. Yeah. Was it one kit on the whole record? Or yeah, just one kit in the whole record. Yeah. What was I, it? It was a uh, for the. It was, to my understanding, I was thinking it was, eighty percent is the is a canopus canopus. Are you say yeah canopus? Mm. Um, I think the the nice, the nice um how do you call it? Sorry, I'm, I'm not speaking English very well. Um the. The high end probably series and um mm -hmm. and an old Gresh that we use like Electric Lady, I'm pretty sure. That was a nice vintage round bash twenty inch that was happening. But I'm not sure okay. he used stuff from there, but I'm but probably. And um yeah, Silgen. I use Silgen. I'm I love Silgen since I was I'm a kid, so I use a lot of dark case and master sound and custom hi hats and then I did a stash with some broken symbols and um I can send you a picture in uh, this type of pan thing that I had the, the friend of mine oh, cool. gave me with holes and yeah. 
That's what cool, we cool. use, yeah. Did the snare change? <clears throat> I use a uh, Gretsch Bell Brass. Mm, okay. Yeah, the new one that they, yeah, that I just bought it before the album. I was so happy I was using it for it, yeah. <clears throat> Super that muted. Sounds great. Super muted. We put a um, fabric on the top, you know, the whole thing. Now, what about the tuning? The tom sounded really low. The tuning, um, Luis tuned the drums. So he had this tune bot thing. Mm-hmm. And I think he used the Dennis Chamber setup, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's a Dennis Chamber like tuning measurement or something. And while I got there, I, you know, I tweaked it a little bit too, a little lower. But, uh, but yeah, I tape it up. And, you know, and we went for that beefy. I was looking to sound something between 70s Pink Floyd, but with 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 bottom, yeah, with a lot of bottom. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Mm. So you mentioned the vocal. Were the vocals on all the tracks once you got to the studio, or just a few? I would say, yeah, there, there were there were some. Yeah, I would say eighty percent that were on it. Not the whole vocals. I would say okay. hook, burst, start, and he caught it. So he let me breathe and be creative. It's a whole creative process. You know, he, <clears throat> sometimes he made me like, just play free here, whatever you want. And I just like make some noise, you know, and really cool. It was really, it was really fun. We were laughing the whole time. It was hilarious. It was, it was a really, really great time. And, and he, and, and then he wanted me to follow the vocals and some stuff. And yeah, really, really, it was really fun, man. It was, it was a really great session. To tell you. Some of those spots when the fills are like overdubs, did mm-hmm. you did you stop playing and then go back later and do the fill, or did you play a fill and then replace it later? We, I give him multiple fills. Okay. Sometimes he say, "All right, give me this fill here." First, yeah, we, we the lately I've been noticing the way people produce today. What people do. That in my experience, that I, even when I, if, if you want a track, I record it for you. I always record you the track itself, and then I give you a few versions. I give you my version. I give you your version, and I always do a one take of just me overplaying, so you can cut and use something. Mm-hmm. So with him, we do the same. We did some that were overplaying. We did some that were like just what it is, and we did some takes. Um, and and, and the ones that overplaying, that I think. It doesn't mean that we're playing. I just play in the track and then I just do a fill and then keep it attracting going and just like playing fills on the top. So in case you want to use them and then the, the, the track keep playing. So like that, you know, so he can cut and, and use whatever he wants and what he doesn't, doesn't want to do. And, and that's just modern stuff. Everyone's been doing that lately. I think, especially in my experience, and I love to do it because the more you get, the better you can work with and, the more you can cut and, you know, and do, and definitely, I will always recommend people to do it. Were you surprised when you heard the final record or did it all sound familiar? I was not surprised because with Mon Laferte, I was surprised. With Mon Laferte, I was like, man, this guy is a bad dude. How he deal this stuff? <laughs> but with, but with, with this, I knew he was going to do some bad stuff because I'm, I mean, I'm, I knew it. He's, he's such a bad cat. I'm like, and, and and working with him for, for, for all these years and, and and stuff that we had done, you know, and and he can do a record with, with, with a two hour session. He's, this, these people are really creative. You know, like when we're at Capitol, we were doing a session where we're having problems with some musicians, you know, LA, you know, they got a little weird. So, and, and I was like, dude, let's, let's, I was like, get the guy out. And he's like, of course, I can feed this album right now if I want it. He told me that. I was like, yeah, so, you know, let's do it, you know. And so th- these people, you know, they're really creative. Some people online, they talk about like, oh, yeah, they, he need this, he need that. No, nah, man, this, this guy is there. They're really excellent producers. They don't, they just really good people. Some people are really good drummers. Some people are really good guitar players or whatever. He's a great producer. My man can do anything for sure. Do you are you a songwriter as well? Do you compose? Yeah, I'm a composer. I do write my little jazz compositions that I do. I'm mostly into simplest minimalistic improvisation lately, and of course, and, and jazz composition. So yeah, I do nothing mainstream in the last 
10 years since high school, of course. But, but yeah, I do my own stuff. I'm actually recording an album now in November and hopefully coming up in the next year and we keep you posted nice. about that and all that stuff. Yeah, great. What? How do you compose? you compose a piano or a guitar? I compose with piano. I, I use the piano. Most of the time I'll be using this app called Notion. So I can write it down in, in like in an iPad. I use an iPad so it's simple, it's fast, bass lines. I always start with bass lines. Do a bass line there, create a melody on the top and then Sometimes I, f- I try to find the chords. Sometimes I had the chords before. Most, you know, m- most of the time is, is it depends. Lately, just melodies and bass lines. And from that, I just give that to the musicians and let them be creative. So, so mm. it just turns to something more open in terms of. Sometimes when you tell people what to do the whole time, it kind of like mess you up. Uh, in, in in the type of music that I work with, you know, it's, it's mm. it happens a lot. In my opinion so the more open the more space they have i think the better the result that's a good lesson to be learned i always overwrite and then there's no space for anything yeah. do, you, do you write endings and intros or is that all kind of develop as the band plays i it depends the, the right now lately i just been doing bass lines and melodies from there i do a bass line and a melody then I, I, I do another one and a third one, and usually that means intro A, B. Sometimes I just do just an entire composition based on something that has already been done. And lately I've been using just numbers. Like, like I've been actually experimenting with, um. do you know this, this group called Hella? This oh, is yeah. crazy. Like, yeah, Hill. The, the, yeah, the, I love the, that guy. Yeah, the first, <laughs> the first album, you remember that? It's like a total chaos. So oh, yeah. I've been experimenting with putting numbers together with a, with a, with a, and you know, I like produce click track and, and just follow the, 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 the downbeats with no direction harmonically or rhythmically. And, you know, I've just been tripping with stuff like that and, and uh, and I'm I've been, I've been arranging standards lately too, and but nothing. Mostly in the last four years, I've been rocking with Omar, so that's that's been the the my biggest switch because I usually play a lot of jazz, and then with Omar, I have to condition myself to play pocketing and all the stuff, and and it, it's of course it's been a learning experience. I, I I grew up playing metal and rock and all the stuff in high school. I used to be a big like Dillinger Escape Plan, Slipknot, mm. Candiria, Mad Rock, like strong stuff. And then that bring me to jazz and and of course I play Latin music a lot and all the stuff. So it was not hard to do a transition, but it's mostly um it's two different worlds: jazz and and and, and backbeat. You know, jazz is painting and backbeat is like video game creating, you know, it's really, Mm -hmm. really sync and really accurate, you know. So, yeah, but thank God we're still composing and I have to finish some compositions actually for my album coming up. So, yeah. Wonder how this experience is going to influence your composing from now on. Are you going to try some of this more kind of? Ah, that's what my wife. That's what my wife is saying. <laughs> it's like, yeah, do, do pro rock now. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> yeah. Let me. Just, I had three weeks to agree now. Um, well, I just have to be myself, I think, because if not, um, we, when I was working with Omar, I, st- I started getting a little ready to, you know, to do this backbeat accurate stuff, and then he came with this opposite of that. So I let that go, of course, but, um, but mm. definitely that, that my experimental search is stay, is still quite vivid in my heart, especially in my composition. So that definitely is going to s- stay there. Do I bring in electric instruments? Uh, let's see. But, um, mm. but the sonic experimentation, definitely, definitely. I'm always on it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm always looking for jazz records that have more of that creative production side, like sonically, going for that. Like that's what I want to hear more of. Is yeah, you, yeah. You know, I love the idea of acoustic instruments in a room, but sometimes I want to hear a jazz group play stuff that I don't know what the hell they're doing. Like what are these sounds? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. 
I do I do love um the work of like Taishon Sori and there's, there's, there's some new composers like Daniel Soccer who's great and you know and and I like people like um I will say um Joel Ross and guys like that who are great. Uh but at the same time I love what Omar do and I love all that indie crowd who are really refreshing to that sometimes I feel they're just jazz hits who just had it with jazz, you know, and just went to another <laughs> right. way. But, um, but yeah, like Mary Holberson is great. She kind of remind me of Omar a little bit while I hear her, you know, but, but yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it is, um, we keep searching. The search continues for sure. Who are some of your biggest influences as a drummer? Oh man. Just give me three. Ah, uh, Herbie Jones. For sure, I love Bill Durufor since a kid, and I will say Jackie and Ed. Yeah, great people. That's a nice trio, right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're all searching. They're all continue searching. Yeah, I, I, but lately I've been really into Rashia Lee too. I do love the, the the new cats too. You know, I love like Michael Germore. I love um, Tyshawn Sorry, Justin Brown. You know, all those guys too. So it's, it's, um, at the same time, I do love like, you know, like Chris Penny on, on, on Dillinger Escape Plan. He was amazing. I love Kenneth Schalk from Kenderia. He was great. I love, um, I love percussionists too. Giovanni Hidalgo is amazing. Horacio Negro Hernandez is amazing. You know, they all influence me and, and local Puerto Rican artists too, like Henry Cole. I grew up listening to him. Mm-hmm. You know, people like that. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of people, a lot of people. I forgot to ask you this, but do you have any tips for playing yeah. live drums over loops or the things that we sh- that you should not do or, or definitely do do? Mm. It depends. I do. I don't like to double up snares live. Mm. I'm actually, sometimes I tell people, I'm down to play with a loop, but it was going to be like a, like two snares. Naturally, we're going to flam at one point. Mm-hmm. It's going to sound sloppy. Some people, they can really do it, you know, like, like Spanky McCourty, people who are extremely accurate. They can pull it out. I do, you're going to do something because it's, it's more about the sound that you're looking for. You're looking for something really precise and an and electronic sounding. I prefer to, to use a, a XPDX or something like that, you know, um, something pads, triggers, and just, you know, you have to have your timing have to be solid rock. You have to have a metronome accuracy, but for loops and stuff, I don't like, but, but, but the, but it's the same register as your, as your instrument. It just mm-hmm. sometimes it sound, it happens to me a lot when I work with reggaeton artists. They want me to play that that reggaeton beat, but they keep the same beat too at the same time. And I'm like, dude, this this, this this sound like a batucada. I mean, do you want me to? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you do you want the accuracy? Or do you do you want the bottom? I mean, what do you want? You know, and and and, and that's that's the thing. It, it depends what you want to do, but always I always say this: pl- play with it. You, you, you should be listening to the loop like it's another like like by you like you. You're with him. You're not against him. Like, like you know, like like when you play salsa, you had the conga player, you had the timbale player, you have you had the the, the the main bell, right? So you have to play like like you are one of those instruments. So so basically, you're not against him, but you are with him. So sometimes people they they play a loop and they they're like, let me bury the loop, you know, let me just like. Well, dude, I cannot hear it. This is it. But so, so, so sometimes it groove more when you like actually thinking that he's just another musician. So you're just like adding to that in a way. And, and that's, I think, it's, it's the best way to, to play with a loop. You complement the loop. Don't duplicate mm. the loop. I, I, that's, that's what I would say. You complement the loop, but, you know, like bring your, your – you know, like people, like stuff that Dave Werkel used to do in the eighties, and and and, and Dennis Chambers, that they they were with the loop, but they were bringing colors and they were like flashing the stuff out, and 
And now people, they, they, they're a little confused. Now they're just over drumming of it, you know, but, but those guys that were just complimenting, you know, they were, they were, they were over the bar line, but they were not like over the song. You know what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. so that's, that's one thing that I was, that will always recommend and just try and t- avoid that register for sure. Don't tune your snare drum the same as the loop. Or if, if they want that, then take them to tell them to take the snare off and use your snare or the opposite. Don't play the snare. And then, you know, because if not, sometimes it's just life today. And it's, it's, it can mess you up mm. sonically in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, was the percussion on the tracks when you recorded? Or was that added later? <laughs> no, no. That's my boy, Daniel Diaz. He's a bad cat from Puerto Rico. He's oof, amazing. One of the best ones right now worldwide. This this guy, you see him, he's a skinny white guy like this. And he can play like Pedrito Martinez even better, man. It's crazy. Man. It's just like, <laughs> there's a video actually on YouTube of Pedrito Martinez. Like, he sang him up. Pedrito Martinez is like, oh, my God. Who's who this, who this alien? <laughs> he, he even, he, Pedrito even started cleaning his sweat on his forehead while he's playing. I was like, oh, my God. That's, <laughs> no, no, this guy is amazing. Daniel Diaz is, um, he's trying, right now he's on tour with, um, with Residente. Okay. The, actually, cool. that band, Omar, did it. And, um, and, and, and Leo's on it. Thomas Bridgen is on it. And, and Daniel Diaz is on it. And, and great guy. Wonderful guy. If you want to send your videos of him, so you check it out. It's a wonderful guy. Yeah. Well, I was going to say the percussion on the record is, is so. No, that guy is different level. Front. I mean, it's, it's intense. <laughs> no, that, that guy, he hit the instrument like this. It sound like, 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 like so loud. It's like, <laughs> bah! it's like, bah! Bah! it's like, oh my God. It's like so natural, so natural. It's impressive. So you didn't hear that until after the record was done? No, actually, no, no. He had electronic percussion. and But I worked with Daniel with Mon Laferte, too. And in that album, we did some salsa stuff. We did some cumbias. We did some boleros. And and Daniel is super, super masterful and all that. And he's a, he's a, he's iconic in, the, in that world. He's, he's an influencer, too, you know, the whole thing. Cool. Well, I have a couple more questions. One mm-hmm. question I have to ask everybody. Um, it's been a theme of the show. What was your first snare drum? Oh, man, I was blessed. You're not going to believe me. This is crazy. My dad is a, is a precautionist from, from, from Puerto Rico. And he's, um, and he's too well known. In the 70s and 80s, he was he would work a lot. So in the sorry, 60s and 70s, he was well known. And then... Um, Long story short, Alex Acuna studied music in Puerto Rico. People don't know, but he learned uh, mm-hmm. the drum set and Caribbean music in, in, in the conservatory of Puerto Rico. So Alex studied with my dad. So when Alex left Puerto Rico, he left his Gresh drum set. <laughs> no kidding. So he left a round bash that I, myself, as an idiot, pulled, pushed to a pool for a rock music video. <laughs> when I was 14. So imagine my dad, how he felt. It's like, what are you doing? I was like with my nails all black, you know, I was all metal and stuff. Total idiot. So yeah, it was, it was a crash that I ruined forever. The bass drum like never was the same. Man, it was oh, in the pool. No. <laughs> so yeah, so <laughs> it was a crash round bash with a Ludwig. The snare was not great, but it was an old wood Ludwig. It was a basic set, man. It was a 13... 20 by 14 and 16 by 16 probably actually white grass drum set beautiful I'm, every day i cry about it to tell you the truth like oh mm. what an idiot what it did are they still around or they get thrown away man i hope i'm um, to tell you too man you know Puerto Rico is, is we get affected a lot by storms and stuff and i think that kid got messed up with um with a hurricane in, in uh, probably maria and actually right now i try to be in touch with my family because they the, oh, the storm, storm yeah that no the storm hit yesterday yeah destroyed the whole island i haven't been able to talk to them but i hope it's safe man yeah. yeah, that's wild yeah yeah so, is too. the bad place right now unfortunately yeah yeah well um only last thing to ask is what else is going on and what should we let people know about coming out i mean obviously we want everyone to listen to this new mars volta record and check mm. out things you've done previously but what's coming up so you got a new solo record coming out? I got my own solo record coming out in um, next year. Uh, for the Mars Volta, follow them. Uh, they, they're going on tour right now. It's just beautiful music, and I'm happy 
hopefully catch with them soon. And um, I have a drum fest now. It was announced for the 21st October in Puerto Rico, but I don't know if it's going to happen because the storm just happened, unfortunately. But um, mm. I was looking forward to that. going to have Robbie Amin on and a few. Um, I don't know you know uh, Tony Scapa. He's a great oh, yeah. drummer. Yeah, he's, oh, yeah. He's, he was on Thank it you, too. Martin. Yeah. And a lot of people, but let's see now because the storm just destroyed the power grid again there. So mm-hmm. hopefully I can do it. Well, yeah, we, we continue to play here. We're in New York. Um, you oh, feel free to reach out on my Instagram as Willie Timba. We're always doing stuff around town. You want to come in and, and check me out. We're always there. And, um, but yeah, definitely stay tuned. My album's coming out next year and, um, and a lot of beautiful stuff coming up too. Great. Well, thank you so much for hanging, and congratulations on this record and everything else. Thank you, Mike. You've got a new, uh, you've got a new number one fan here. I've been listening to it nonstop all day. So oh <laughs> man, thank you. Yeah, it is. It is enchanting. I love it too. Yeah, it's a beautiful album. <laughs>